Um, I'd like to talk to you today about the case for using genetically modified plants as a source of sustainable bioenergy. Well, as you've heard in the first session today, we know that um, our demand for energy, water and food is increasing. And that's in the context of um, an environment where um, population is growing to, we estimate, 9 to 10 billion over the next few decades, out to 2050. So um, I'm particularly interested in, uh, in this talk in uh, the component of energy. How are we going to fulfill our energy demands in the future? For energy, we estimate that we're going to need 70% uh, more energy than our demand currently today. Um, how will we achieve that? Uh, what, what's bad about that? Well, of course, we know that that's leading to these carbon emissions that James just alluded to. It's, uh, this current figure here shows something from the International Energy Agency. It shows a red line, which is our reference scenario. So this is what you th think of as our business of, as usual scenario. If we continue living the sort of 20th century life that we, we're currently living, this is what will happen to global carbon emissions. They're predicted to rise, and those rises will come from different parts of the planet, uh, particularly India and China. And the green line there is a scenario going forward to set us on a track to maintain our carbon dioxide increase at 450 parts per million. Now, that still represents over a 40% increase since the onset of the Industrial Revolution. For planet Earth, that's unprecedented, that, that level of rise. Uh, the plants and animals on the planet haven't seen that amount of carbon dioxide for several million years in our evolutionary history. But nevertheless, if we can try to contain our increase in carbon over the coming decades, that would be a good thing. We know that this carbon dioxide leads to warming. We're looking at a two degree C warming as it is. How might we do that? Well, if we look at the data for 2030 there, about half of that green line must come from efficiency gains. There's absolutely no question we need to use energy more efficiently. But about a quarter of it, of that um, big, the, the big amount of carbon dioxide that we need to pull back, comes from renewables and one of those renewables and the renewable that I'm particularly interested in is using land to grow green plants which harness the energy of sun the sun they're the only ultimate form of renewable energy they turn the sun's energy into simple sugars and complex carbohydrates so again the red line is our business as usual our energy demand there is over the coming decades is fulfilled by coal and gas largely but we can see um, if we move to the green line the 450 scenario, biomass is part of a basket of things that we can do with renewables to get us back on track. There are others, of course, I'm not going to talk about those today, but biomass is undoubtedly important. In fact, the UK government has stated that it's one of the most cost efficient and environmentally sensitive ways to decarbonise our society, to use biomass to generate combined heat and power. So it has a future. But of course, it's controversial. The problem with using green plants for energy is they take up land. And so we might need that land for other things. And see, these are some of the questions that have been posed in recent years. Is bioenergy really low carbon? There are some reports it might be as carbon intense as coal, for example. What about the land we use? Can we use lots of different types of land for growing bioenergy? We know that there have been issues with tropical rainforests that have been cut down, which have threatened species, such as the orangutan here. Ecosystem services, these are the things that our, our ecosystems deliver that are of benefit to us. For example, water, food, climate regulation. Can bioenergy negatively impact these things? Well, um, there's an oil palm plantation there, which suggests that the planting of these oil, um, um, oil uh, plantations, palm plantations, has led to starvation of millions of people. But it's worth remembering that oil palm in the tropics, only 10% of that's used for energy and the rest is for cosmetics and food. 
What about if we displace food crops? So we start growing energy crops on land for food. This, this can um, have an indirect effect on land use change. It can be very negative. So we need to develop these sustainability criteria to be able to identify what are the good biofuels and the bad biofuels. So we need some guiding principles. And there are three guiding principles that we should work towards. The first is that these bioenergy crops, they have to be resource use optimised, they have to be intensified so that smaller areas of land can be used to develop them. The second is that they have to have a reasonable carbon footprint. They have to be better than oil. And the third is that we can't damage our ecosystems. So where are we going on this, uh, on this learning this learning curve. Of course, we've been learning to do oil for, since the onset of the Industrial Revolution. Le using biology to develop the bioeconomy is, is just a, a deca decade or so old. And you can see here that we initially started using food crops for biofuel, and that hasn't been to great consequence because that's interfered with food production, which um, is not what we want to do. But in the future, we're going to move to these lignocellulosics, the second generation generation non-food crops or trees and sometimes grasses. I just wanted to remind you that trees are some of the largest organisms on planet Earth. This is uh, one single tree, it's a specimen tree from um, the temperate rainforests in northern USA. So trees and grasses as well contain a very large amount of biomass. There's plenty of potential on the planet that we might be able to use if we could manage it effectively. Now our bioenergy non-food tree crops are not going to look like those ones in the temperate uh, rainforests. They're more likely to look like these. Fast growing trees such as this one, which is poplar. Willow is another example. So um, carbon footprinting, we're doing a, an immense amount of work to identify, characterise and ensure that the carbon footprint of these non-food energy crops is sustainable. So you can see here a field in Sussex, this is some government funded research where people in my group are actually measuring the carbon footprint of um, this bioenergy crop. So we measured the carbon in from photosynthesis, the carbon out in respiration, and how the tree stores carbon. And we compare that to arable and grassland fields to have some understanding that this system is sustainable. And the results are looking pretty good, that if you grow um, these trees for energy, they're a net sink, they draw down carbon, whereas annual production actually releases carbon back to the environment. But what about this intensification question, getting more from less, more yield from less? Well, if you looked at the potential yield of these bioenergy crops, so this is in poplar and willow, we know that they could produce about 35 tonnes per hectare of biomass per year. That's fantastic. But actually, if you put them in a commercial field in the UK, they're more likely to produce around 10 or less. And this is what we term the yield gap. And this yield gap is large. It exists because the genotypes, the genetics, are not well matched to the environment. There are pests, there are pathogens. The trees are exposed to drought. They're grown in non-optimal conditions. We need to understand how we can increase yield and yield intensity. Can genetic modification help? That's the case I want to propose to you today. Well, this is a pressing issue, and in fact so pressing that the Prime Minister, David Cameron, wrote to the government chief scientist just last year and asked if he could provide evidence on the benefits and risks of GM technology in general. And uh, the Council for Science and Technology, his group of uh, experts, reported back in November 2013. And you can see there that they're fairly confident that these GM products are as safe as their, as their conventional counterparts. We don't have any growing in the UK at the moment, however. But if we go to the rest of the world, this figure shows you the, the hit parade of where genetically modified food is being grown. And you can see top of the hit parade is 69 million tons, uh, 69 million hectares of growth in the US. And then down in Brazil and Argentina. So these are uh, genetically modified soy. That soy is made into feed, which our animals eat in Europe. And so GM has been embraced as a technology in the rest of the world, and Europe is rather out on a limb in, in that 
sense. So perhaps there are some benefits to these crops because they don't damage the environment in some ways, particularly to do with carbon footprinting, because they require less chemicals. What about genetic modification? What, what can it offer? Well, it can offer rather frivolous things, like these purple carnations which hit the UK in December last year. We can now change the colour of a, a flower you might buy um, in Tesco in a, in, a, in, a, in a very dull winter's day. In fact, the, the least sustainable thing you can do is buy winter flowers in a supermarket that have been grown in the Netherlands under glass. The carbon footprint of those is horrendous. But of course, GM can offer big benefits to Africa, for example. The bottom example is GM cassava, which has been biofortified with vitamin A, and it's also resistant to a very, very important root pathogen. And so it can offer big benefits in developing countries. What about what we want to do um, to make biofuel? We want to get liquid fuel from wood for the future. And this liquid fuel is ethanol, and to do that, we have to pre-treat the wood, we have to bash it up, we have to break it apart, we have to hydrolyze the wood, we have to make it release the glucose, which is about 40%. We then have to ferment the glucose and make the ethanol. It's a biorefining process analogous to oil refining. It requires lots of chemicals, very strong acids, enzymes which are synthesized, microbes and enzymes. It's very expensive and these take the resources of the planet and impact on the, the footprint, the carbon footprint of the product. Can genetic modification help? Well, here's one scientific study which suggests that there might be some um, potential for GM to help. This is a, a field of genetically modified trees in Belgium, and a similar field trial was also set up in France. And you can see three bunches of stems there. The top one is the normal or the wild type wood that's been taken from the tree. And then the two F lines are the, uh, the GM lines. And as a side effect, um, we can see that the GM lines have slightly red wood, and that's been um, quantified. What the scientists have actually done to these trees is they've modified a, um, a macromolecule, a chemical constituent of the wood called lignin. It's a pretty complex chemical which gives wood some of its strength and helps um, uh, defend the trees from some pathogens. And they've downregulated the amount of lignin in the wood. Are these trees better at producing biofuel? Well, um, the, the Belgian field trial is shown on the left there, the left three bars, and the French on the right. And you can see the wild type. And you can see here the amount of ethanol that's yielded from the GM trees. And in the French site, it's a staggering 161% increase relative to the wild type. And so we have to conclude from that that these GM trees produce more bioethanol. So by using biotechnology, we've developed a tree. Colleagues in, in uh, Belgium and France have developed some GM trees which now have cell walls which disassemble much more easily, release their sugar, which is then fermented to make bioethanol. Is it sustainable? Well, the trees don't go into the food cycle, so we don't eat them. Um, they don't flower because they're grown in a very short rotation. And they're native plants to Europe in any case. So a lot of the concerns that we might have about using food crops for this technology don't really um, come into consideration in using trees in this way. So I'd like to um, conclude by um, proposing that genetic modification provides one mechanism that we should consider for intensifying our land use in future. And if we're able to weigh up some of the benefits and risks, we may be able to use it in a way which helps us to be much more sustainable. Thanks very much.